Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me into your front room this morning. Uh, it's lovely to be with you. Uh, I'd like to begin with, begin with a question, if I may. Uh, there are no prizes, but if you can post your answers on the chat or comment section, that'd be great. So my question is this. What is the link between these four things? Moses, a 1963 Beatles lyric, Donald Rumsfeld, and our text this morning from the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done. Well, perhaps it's more of a riddle than a question. Uh, mull on it, let me know your thoughts. Um, but before this degenerates into a pale imitation of Round Britain quiz, uh, why don't we pray together as we begin? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that uh, you are there and you are not silent. Thank you that you have spoken your word and thank you that it is a life-giving word. Uh, we pray, Heavenly Father, you'd help us understand it right this morning. Uh, that understanding it, it might transform our thinking and our living, that we might know you better and be better able to make you known. And we ask this for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, <clears throat> if this is the first time I've joined you on a Sunday morning, uh, thank you for having me. It's a difficult time at the moment, isn't it, for many people, many people grieving, unable to be comforted by family and friends, and for many more who are anxious and fearful. Christians know that we should pray in such circumstances. Indeed, we want to pray in such circumstances, but we often don't know how to. So aware of our weaknesses, we've been turning these last few weeks to the Lord's Prayer to help us, to Jesus' instructions to his disciples on how to pray. And we've got to this phrase, thy will be done. What does that mean? And what are we praying for when we say, thy will be done? And how can such a prayer offer us any help to us in our current circumstances, our fear, with fears and anxieties? They're the two questions I want to look at briefly this morning. Thy will be done. Begs the question, of course, what God's will is. <clears throat> um, now, that is a big question, isn't it? That's a huge one. And it touches on many things about God, um, his foreknowledge, his sovereignty, his power, um, the place of evil, the whole issue of suffering. Um, it's a huge area. Uh, and more besides. Uh, and they're important topics, subjects, uh, important questions, um, but there's simply not time to plumb them all this morning. In the few minutes we've got, I really just want to look at two aspects of God's will <clears throat> that I think will help us and that I will hope help us to navigate things in the days ahead. So I will be done. It's a third petition of the prayer, isn't it? Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, and thy will be done. All of which shows the massive shift, if you think about it, of someone that someone undergoes when they become a Christian. A concern for God's reputation, hallowed be your name, and for his rule to be established, your kingdom come, and for his plans to be fulfilled, thy will be done. And once it was a complete irrelevance. Now it has become more important than many of the other things that once consumed us. And wanting these things, praying for these things, working for these things, uh, it's a vivid illustration of a transformed life in someone who knows Jesus. Jesus prays for God's will to be done. Do you remember? In the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, not my, but your will be done. And his followers echo that prayer. <clears throat> but that still begs the question, doesn't it? What is God's will? It helps, I think, to do, uh, think of God's will into two distinct but related parts which brings us back to Moses, Donald Rumsfeld, and the Beatles. Uh, you may remember Rumsfeld. He was the American Secretary of Defense under a couple of presidents. Most famous, perhaps, for a quote about uh, he made at the time of the Iraq uh, issues of mass weapons of mass destruction. He said this, Reports that say that something hasn't happened are always interesting to me, because, as we know, there are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. <clears throat> but there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. And it's the latter category that tend to be the difficult ones. There are things we know we know, known knowns, according to Rumsfeld, and there are things we know we don't know, known unknowns. Which brings us to Moses. And a quote from one of his sermons recorded for us in Deuteronomy chapter 29. 
Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. The God of the Bible who created and who sustains all things had and has a plan, a purpose. Now, at this moment, I've got that orphan cutlery song going around in my head, but I'll spare you my rendition of it. Uh, you may know it. <clears throat> God has a plan. And it's one he hatched before the beginning of time. A plan to have a people, a family for his son. Our reading this morning was a very brief summary of that plan. And it's one that the whole of the rest of the Bible fills in. Uh, from Ephesians 1, if you still have it in front of you, let me read it again. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. To be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and earth under Christ. God has a plan, and he's been working out that plan before, since before the creation of the world. He is at work to bring that purpose and plan about. It's a plan that's centred on Christ and involves the redemption of a people for him. It's achieved through the cross and it's all of grace. It's all a gift. Now, this plan was, according to Paul here, do you see verse nine, a mystery, a secret, <clears throat> like an Agatha Christie novel. Actually, no, it's nothing like an Agatha Christie novel. Uh, but bear with me. It's like an Agatha Christie novel in this respect, that the clues had been given. They were there all the time and are clear in retrospect, once the secret is out. Once Christ has come, once he's died and been raised, and the message about him proclaimed, the secret is indeed out. Because God has made it known, verse 9. He made known to us the mystery of his will. The mystery, once hidden, is now an open secret. So he can write in chapter 3, verse 6 of Ephesians, that the mystery is through the gospel. The Gentiles are heir together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Jesus Christ. You see, once it was hidden, but that's no longer the case. Because the New Testament reveals what the Old Testament saw and foreshadowed, the boundless riches of Christ. And this is now revealed. How so? Well, as the gospel is preached, as folk hear it and turn back to God in repentance and faith. As we pray in the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done, we're praying for this known known. That is to say, we're praying that God's will, his plans and purposes, given to us in scripture, finally revealed to us in the gospel, made known by others too. And that we, in turn, seek to make it known as we tell people about Jesus. And in doing so, we're acknowledging God's plan, accepting that plan, and indeed praying for it, that God would bring those plans and purposes to conclusion, for the gospel to go out, for people to hear about Jesus and what he's done, and to turn back to God, trusting in his promises, receiving forgiveness, being adopted into his family, and therefore experience all the blessings of restored relationship with God. The known knowns, thy will be done. Okay, you say, <clears throat> I've got that, um, but what about his will for me? Does God have a plan for me? And the answer, of course, of that is yes. Can I be certain what that plan is? And again, the answer is yes. The, pl the plan is to be caught up in this redeemed creation as a member of God's people. To which you say, okay, oh, I didn't mean that, actually. I know that. I, I mean his individual plan for me. You know, the, on the smaller scale, if you like, not the, not the big, huge, cosmic, universal scale, but the small one, the personal, the individual. Does he have a will and a plan for me, for my life? You say, I know he has, he's committed his plan for his people, but does he can play about me as an individual? Is he committed to me? And I think that's a, a common question and a fair question. 
which, believe it or not, brings us back to the Beatles. Do you remember their track <clears throat> uh, on the album? I think, please, please me, but Max will correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, uh, the track, Do You Want to Know a Secret? Again, I won't sing it. But the answer to that is generally yes, isn't it? We want to know secrets, especially when they concern us. And God, in his mercy, has told us a lot about what concerns us. And that has not so much been whispered in our ear, but it's been written down for our eyes to see, our ears to hear, as it's been proclaimed far and wide for the last 2,000 years. And, and to push the ly lyric and the analogy to be on breaking point, he hasn't told us, asked us not to tell, quite the reverse. He's commanded us to go and tell all peoples so that they can be brought into his plans too. But does God have a plan and a purpose for us as individuals, for me and for you? Oh, yes, as that annoying dog might put it. He does. And he is equally committed to them. Can I be certain what that plan is? Well, yes, again, the answer is yes. You can be absolutely certain what it is. Absolutely certain. But, and here's the catch, only in retrospect. Because unlike the big scale plans, he's not revealed his individual plans for us, to us. They exist, he knows them, but to us they are the unknown knowns, known to God, but unknown to us. Even if at the same time they are no less certain and no less sure. Because he is a sovereign, his sovereignty extends just as much over our individual lives as over the big sweep of history. Now, I realise that saying that raises lots of questions, these unknown knowns, the secret things that belong to God and that Moses spoke of. Because we often want to know the unknown knowns so that they can become known knowns. And of course, they do become known knowns when they've happened. Often our issue is that we want to know them in advance. We don't want to know what job God wants us to apply for, where he wants us to live, who he wants us to marry, before we even apply for the job, buy the house, or say, I will. But we only get to know these parts of his plans for us, the less important like bits, actually, despite what we often think, once they've happened. Despite a common concern for many, it is not possible to be outside God's will. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that God rejoices in sin or suffering or illness or pain. He does not take equal pleasure in all that he permits. We know he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather they turn from their wicked ways and live. But many still die apart from Christ. So the individual details of our lives, we don't know them in advance, we can't. But God does, they belong to him and will pan out according to his will. Knowing that, means that we're not left to drown in a sea of possibilities, paralysed by choice, fearful of making a mess of things by making the wrong decision, because we can never be outside God's will. It does mean, however, that we should seek to make wise and godly decisions. For although we do not know and cannot know in advance how things will pan out for us as individuals, God has made it clear how he wants us to live, his will in that respect. He's given us principles to live by, to guide the choices we make and ask us to trust him that they are given to us for our good, and so respond in the obedience of faith. When he calls us, in view of God's mercy, to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, to not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds, we see that self-sacrificial service is God's will for us in any given situation. When he calls us to be very careful how we live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, not to be foolish, not to get drunk on wine, but instead be filled with the Spirit, we see that wise and opportunistic evangelism and holiness of life, empowered by the Spirit, is God's will for us. When you remember the instruction to give thanks in all circumstances, we see that the secret of contentment in both need and plenty is to accept the will of God, confident that he will supply what we need, and so on and so on. As we pray, thy will be done, we are willingly submitting ourselves to the rule of Christ over the big stuff and over the little stuff. And we are submitting ourselves and our families and our world to the Father's revealed purposes, the mystery made known, the gospel, 
and to the Father's secret decrees, trusting that his will is always good and just, even though you know, we don't need, know the details in advance. And we can do that because we know from what he has revealed that he is good and can be trusted. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we're expressing our desire for the fulfilment of and our commitment to his plans, and individ both individual and corporate, and our longing to see them completed, our commitment to seek to further them as we seek to walk in the obedience of faith. So let's not sweat the small stuff, and let's pray that God will enable us to do just that. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that you've had a plan for eternity, from eternity for your son, Thank you that you've redeemed a people for him to the praise of his glorious grace. And thank you that we can be caught up in that as we hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus, hear what he's done and turn to you in repentance and faith. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that as we continue to trust in those promises, we would trust in you for the small things of life as well knowing that all things in the big and small, even in our current difficult circumstances, that your will will be done. And we ask these things for Christ's sake. Amen.